1937, my uncle sold to my dad an almost new set of Lionel trains and accessories. I was only a year old and an only child. It became a tradition in my family for the train to be set up around the Christmas tree, elaborate and lovely, and for twenty years it was a rare time of closeness for my dad and me. You see, he was ill most of his life, with aching, racking pain, anger, and a feeling of helplessness. However, he was a gentle man in his true nature, and the finest mind and largest range of interest and knowledge of any person that I have ever met. He died at fifty, and my mother tragically a year later, but they left me a few warm and abiding memories. The Sunday before Christmas, the house was filled with the smell of baking and pine needles. The morning brought the shopping for the tree, and the afternoon meant that my dad and I go to the garage and pull down two large dusty boxes and a strange last brown suitcase. We'd sit in the living room, and I would clean the track and the engine and the cars one by one and take them out of their little orange, blue, and cream-colored Lionel boxes. I'd clean each wheel, and Dad would open the old suitcase, and in the mothballed silence he'd take out some wondrous green mats, and we'd lay the wires to the great black transformer and control board. There was something unspoken between us as each piece was connected. There was a little man who would spring from this tiny metal house to wave a red lantern at the ever-circling unseen engineer. The menacing block signal would stop the train with its red light, make it sit for a minute or so, and then, granting green permission, allow the grinding, clattering engines and cars to go on. The black-and-white striped crossing gate loudly buzzed and slammed down its oversized red bulb, threatening an immobile metal automobile, circa 1930. Behind the tree was a green paper mache tunnel and a long cloud metropolis panorama into which the train would disappear on its most distant journey and reappear to make a loud metallic whistle when I chose to push the octagonal button. Oh, and the knife switches that I would throw with a sense of incredible power. The red and green lit track switches would jerk around with a show of incredible power and redirect the approaching train safely to the clear track. All the while, Mother was baking cookies that would have delicious shapes, bells, Christmas trees, half moons, and diamonds, all pressed with tiny cups. The drips of dough fell away, waiting to be remolded, and they tasted better than candy, or rum, which I was permitted to place on my tongue when the company arrived. Then the afternoon was complete. The early December sunsets disappeared to the clear and cold skies of California stars. Evening brought music. The old lacquered 78s of Bing Crosby and Fred Waring, from which I first heard the Carol of the Bells. My dad didn't like that song, but it still haunts me as Christmas. In later years, along with the 78s, there were new records of Robert Shaw, Roger Wagner, and Appalachian carols of my own choosing. I first learned about folk music from my dad, who would laugh and cry when he told a fellow named Carl Sandberg who came to his high school in Pittsburgh and sang Foggy Foggy Doo. Sandberg's American Song Bag sat proudly on our bookshelves, along with H.G. Wells, Shakespeare, Robert Heinlein, and infinite histories of American pop music and recordings. Sometimes, on that Sunday before Christmas, my dad would take out his old Gibson mandolin and sing Foggy Foggy Doo. It was a rare moment of wonder and embarrassment, for he'd talk the song more than sing it, and then he'd sing and play some popular Christmas ballad. How can I tell you of the honored place of music in our house? Seventy-eighths of Beethoven and King Oliver, Bessie Smith, Dvorak, Von Suppe, Crosby, and Fats Waller. These records lined one whole wall and were the first thing one noticed upon entering the house, whatever house we lived in. Dad knew them all, and Mother only complained of their loudness, except for Crosby, of course, the Pope of Christmas. 
Life is not the same without Crosby or the train or mom and dad. In my 23rd year, after being away for several Christmases, I inquired about the train. Mother assured me that it was safely stored in a friend's garage. In 1960, my first child was born, and in 1961, the year of Dad's death, I phoned the people who had stored it, and the answer came from a distance that I believe would never be golfed. Oh, the train! Well, our children got into the garage, pulled out the train, and scattered it over the neighborhood, and when we found it, it was all rusted and cruddy, so we gave it to the goodwill. I have endured landlords, poverty, war, and illness, birth and death, but nothing has ever upset me or given me a greater sense of helplessness than those terse, telephonically transmitted words. For 19 years, they were ritualized in anger and frustration. A few years ago, I began to search, unbelieving, for the exact replacement of the train and its tradition. In 1979, I journeyed to Seattle to be with my five-year-old daughter Lisa at Christmas time. We went to a large, lovely house owned by a man who had loved and collected toy trains all his life and sold them in his retirement. There in the back room, lying in a large heap of unsorted junk, I found two of the green passenger cars. There was the old red bulb crossing gate and the grand transformers, too. The block signal and several fine engines peeked out. And there was a little man who would pop out and light his red lantern, except his arms had fallen off. There were miles and miles of track and switches, all waiting for my restoring love. When I found the train, it was two days after the traditional twelfth day of Christmas. I called it the fourteenth day of Christmas, and I have celebrated it ever since. <laughs>